I met Joseph on the day that he died. He was a healthy, happy 10-year-old boy with just very mild asthma. It wasn't a big part of his life or his identity. He was out playing with his friends outside on a atypically hot and humid day for that time of year when he suddenly dropped to the ground. His friends called for help. And Grown-ups came running, and they started CPR. Paramedics continued it, and so did the hospital staff when he reached the hospital. And eventually, they restored his pulse. I met him about an hour later. And at that time, we knew two things. First, he'd had a devastating brain injury, and he was very unlikely to survive. And the second, the cause of his cardiac arrest was asthma. When I shared this with his mother, she stopped and said, huh, it was really humid out today. And that sent chills down my spine. Then, now, and every time I tell this story, which is often, because she believes her child was a victim of climate change, and she's given me permission to share this story, obviously protecting anonymity, because she doesn't want any other family or child to suffer like theirs. What do you think? My name is Anna Guntz, and I'm a pediatrician, a pediatric ICU doctor, and I founded the second environmental health ch clinic for children in Canada. My education started in geography before I took a left turn and realized my calling in medicine. And because of that perspective, I noticed in medicine, when the training, we didn't really hear much about environment and health, and even when patients asked about it. And the thing that was so chilling to me, or one of the things about the mother's reaction, is her concept of how her son's life and the environment were so connected. It must have been so embedded in her consciousness and understanding of the world and life that it popped up at that truly traumatic moment. And I have, I have heard other families make connections, and sometimes it comes out of kind of what would seem like left field. If I'm saying, why do you believe your child is ill, and we know that they have a bacteria in their blood or an autoimmune condition, and I'd hear things like the mold in our house or the traffic outside our door. And that made me curious. And I have every one of those families to thank, because that led me on a path to discover child environmental health as a specialty. I should also mention, from my perspective, I recognize I grew up in Western culture. I trained with the Western medicine and the Western scientific model. And I have very much been shaped learning from the guardians of this land that have lived here for time immemorial about how to live with the land and connect with it. And as well by indigenous knowledge, from what I understand from friends and colleagues, where the mind-body-land relationship is so embedded, it's embedded in culture, in language, and knowledge, and all of these things. And it holds a really high importance and validity for us to walk beside it with Western science as we move forward. Now let's go back to the question, do you think she was right? Was Joseph's death associated with climate change? I also want to recognize it's kind of a polarizing term for some people. So if that's you, really what I'm gonna be talking about is how we, we all know about the mind-body connection, but how the things that we breathe, the food that we eat, the water that we drink, that's what I'm terming as the environment, how that is related as well. So there's something for all of us. And perhaps some of you are wondering, well, climate change is so many things, and it's such a phenomenon, and it changes over such a long time. How could you ever make the connection between that as a phenomenon with one child on one day and one event? And the truth is, I can't prove it, and that's not the point, but I will address that. But just so we're all on the same page, when people talk about that climate change and health effects, what they're doing is it's a summation of all a ton of literature and research that looks at a specific health question related to one of the phenomenon that's associated with it. And air pollution is often placed in there as well because the root cause is often the same, the combustion of fossil fuels. And if you think of forest fires, essentially the weather conditions that are made worse by climate change make fire, 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 fire in the forest worse. So that's where that comes from. So for example, extreme heat and pregnancy, drought and suicide risk in farmers. This is, this is how it's done. Now going back to this concept of why can't I prove that his death is associated with that one thing, 
a lot of people will come to the environmental health clinic and ask, like, can you prove that this, my kid's arthritis is associated with mold? And that concept of proof is really hard when it comes to environment and health. And the reason, there's a lot of reasons for that, and let me just explain for a little bit. Part of it is if we're not looking for it, if we're not inquiring about it, there is a knowledge gap about even in a medical field, our understanding of the relationships we've already identified. So if we're not asking, if we're not looking, and we don't know, we'll miss it. And that makes me think of all these patients that we have and who I love seeing in our clinic who have definite disease or illness or symptoms and no one can explain them. So it's asking, could it be the environment? But you know, there's a lot of other complexities. So if you're exposed to something, you might get an immediate reaction to it, or you might just have a coincidental reaction, and they, they may not be related. Sometimes it's delayed by years or decades. Sometimes you need one exposure and another one that acts synergistically, or an early exposure early in life that might then leave you susceptible to another exposure that leads to a health effect later on. There's also delays in generations. So for example, women who were exposed to DDT in pregnancy, it was shown that their daughters had higher risks of breast cancer, and their granddaughters had higher risks of cardiometabolic disease. The other thing is the, you know, the source and the symptoms might not be intuitive. So for example, heat. If I told you that people were dehydrated and they had heat stroke or heat stress or sunburns, you'd be like, okay, that makes sense. But it's also triggered or associated with heart attacks, strokes, risks of you know, sudden death. And for many reasons outside of that, just a little less intuitive. Or air pollution, you know, that I said long term, air pollution has been associated with lung cancer, but maybe it's alarming, but intuitive. But when it comes to, um, it is also these microparticles actually go from the lungs into our bloodstream, and we think that's why we also think, see things like dementia, brain tumors in children, and even schizophrenia in young people. And going back to Joseph, Extreme heat and air pollution are both independently associated with asthma. So what she said is actually quite plausible. The other big piece here is that, honestly, do any of us really know all the things that we come in contact with on a daily basis? There's just so much, and we might not have the information. It might not be easy to get. But if we look at just the sheer mass of things, there are chemicals and new substances that are being created every year. So we can't know the long-term effects. And there was a study in 2020 that estimated 350,000 chemicals and chemical mixes on the market then. And with new you know, approvals coming in every year, there's such a sheer volume that we often rely on industry-sponsored research to say whether it's healthy or not, if we even require them at all in our country's regulation systems. And while you would want to believe that there's objectivity there, and, and I'm sure that there's high quality in some cases, unfortunately, there's been very high profile reports of some industry concealing some of the harmful effects when they've uncovered them. And in a, as upsetting as that is, it's an understandable why. At the end of the day, it's people. We talk about systems and industry, but they're really made of people who are stressed and making difficult decisions. I'm not excusing, I'm just understanding. And a lot of people might not realize as well this link. Right now we're in a situation where it doesn't matter how rich you are, where you live, where you live in the world, these contaminants are being released at, in millions of tons a year. And we've, I'm sure, all heard reports of you know, microplastics being held and found in some of the most remote places on Earth, the bottom of our oceans, the tops of our mountains, and even in human placenta. So this is affecting us all now. So while I might not be able to prove that your arthritis is associated with the plastic lunchbox that you use, that's not the point. We, just because we can't prove something, it's important to wonder and be curious and be comfortable not knowing and being uncertainty. And that wondering that I did led me to wonder, wait, why are we even having to prove something's bad for us? Why aren't we asking, how can this be good for us? Because if we ask, how can this be good for us, we can still be curious, we still have to be academic and rigorous, but the burden of proof isn't, is on something that's much more attainable than proving something's bad, which why part of the reasons that I've explained about why it's so hard. If I gave you a cup of something and I said, hey, I just made this, don't worry, you can drink it, I can't prove it's bad for you, would you drink it? My guess is no, and if you say yes, you shouldn't, Unsolicited medical advice, don't do that. But that's kind of where we are. And then it led me to think, why, 
why did it take me so long to even think of this? And I realized, I started to realize, I grew up in cities and I was scared. I knew to be scared of the water. I didn't realize I was scared. I just knew I wanted to be in it, but I don't touch it, I don't drink it, I don't bathe in it, it's dangerous. The air is polluted and it's great if you have clean air, but we don't, so you just, I, you know. And, and truthfully, I think I'd seen a lot of examples of people asking for these things or organic food and there's a lot of negative narratives that weren't to describe them. You know, they weren't strong, aren't realistic against progress, these kind of things. And what's shocking to me is this realization came really late on in my life. Like, I had been trained and learned about how our health is not only affected by the social determinants, so where we live, our housing, our race, our, our family's education, economics, but then also there's this ecological model which puts the environmental factors that influence all these things. But it didn't, it didn't connect for me. There was something not right until I heard a phenomenal scholar, Dr. Nicole Redvers, who's world-renowned as an indigenous planetary health um, practitioner, as well as a proud Dene woman, she was explaining how our life and a river's life are intertwined. If we live by a river and we're drinking the water, it becomes part of ourselves, it becomes part of us, and given how much of our bodies are made up of water, eventually, as we, as we give water back to the river, and we are made of that river water, they're intertwined. And then I went, of course, it's the same with oxygen. As we breathe in oxygen, though we're using that for a reason, to make our cells and make energy, the food, we need building blocks that become part of our cells and our body. The environment is the most personal and intimate thing we have with it. So we really need to hold it at the close. And unfortunately, all of the social determinants and the external environmental factors, they all determine what we're breathing, what we're eating, what we're drinking. And so holding that right at the beginning, mind, body, environment, right there, that's the core to that, and that's changed my practice. And that might seem kind of scary, because I've just talked about like, hey, a lot of you know, pollution, a lot of things we can't control. But we have to remember that our bodies didn't evolve to require things that could be harmful to us to survive. It evolves in connection with nature and these natural things. And it turns out there are decades worth of literature, as well as many cultures and indigenous knowledge, that show that connecting with nature has a phenomenally benefit, a huge benefit on our mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual health. And that goes beyond whether it's contaminated or not. Simple things like how gardening can be used in schizophrenia as a treatment to support um, patients, or how someone with arthritis or fibromyalgia might have reduced pain if they're doing their physiotherapy where they can see or be in near natural life. So that fundamental piece, our connection with nature, that's the fundamental thread that ties this all together in our personal environment to me. So now going back to Joseph. If it was a little cooler, if the air was a little cleaner, if there was a few more trees where he was playing that day, would he still be with us? I don't know. I will never know. But I'm gonna keep asking that question. Because every time I ask that question, I'm curious. And when I'm curious, I learn. And then I'm, when I learn, I'm communicating with others and speaking with them and conversing. And we're all learning together what we need in our personal environment to be healthy, happy, and to heal together, not just for ourselves and our families and our communities, but for future generations. And one of the big themes here is we need protection and help. The free market hasn't worked for us. We need legislation to help protect us, our bubble out here, to keep our bubble in here safe. Now I'm gonna ask you, I want you to reflect on when I started this and I told you the story about Joseph and I told you what Ma the, her mother said, and I said, what do you think? What do you think now? Has that changed at all? And if so, how? And when you go through your daily life, I invite you to just take 30 seconds a day to just notice your environment. Think about the air, the water, the food, your breath, all of these things, and just notice your environment. And if you start to get anxious, remember that awareness and knowledge, that is an important thing, the first important thing we do. But then remember about the connection to nature and just take a moment to water a plant and notice how it feels and what you're doing. Or go to a window and look at the sky and think about the clouds and where they're moving. Or if you were an eagle, where would you go? And what would you see? Or go outside and take five deep breaths. Stand by a tree and use your five senses. Just take a small moment a day to connect with nature. 
Because when you connect with nature, it connects with you. It's actually a moment of health. It's a moment of well-being. It's a moment of community and connection. And it's a moment of grounding where you can take a step back and think about what you need and the decisions you're going to make to get through the day. And are they grounded in this understanding of what you need and what your ancestors need and what your community needs to be healthy and happy and to heal as a planet and as people. Thank you.